The world tonight is in the grip of a terrible crisis. Those unfortunate mistakes of nature are running wild. How could you register her with that mutant control agency as if she were some sort of criminal? This is Professor Xavier's School for the Gifted. All of us here are mutants, like yourself. We X-Men learn something very special here, Jubilee. A, B, N. It's headphones, Neil! What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. This is my review for the 1992-97 animated X-Men series. So it's all currently streaming on Disney Plus and I figured I would give it a rewatch to see how it is. I say rewatch with an asterisk just because I saw many if not at least probably half of the episodes when they first came out on TV but I never really saw every single one of them until now. Just to the point where I knew enough of the animation style, what was going on, uh, most of the characters that show up and all of that, but I figured I would watch it all now just to get caught up, see how it holds up, see if I still like it, don't like it, that sort of stuff, and see how it relates to the uh, uh, live action X-Men films. So if you've listened to my episode about the live action X-Men films, in general I didn't think that they were bad except for the whole Dark Phoenix saga which they have a four-part um, story arc in the animated series to cover um, that um, introducing Professor X and the X-Men to the Lishar, Liar, the race of aliens for, that have been that know all about the Dark Phoenix and I think the animated series handled it better just because they gave it more breathing room. Um, it kind of makes me want to now go rewatch the live action Dark Phoenix film with um, Sansa, the what's her name, who played Sansa in Game of Thrones to see how that holds up just because in general my memory of it was neither here nor there. I did see it but I didn't think anything good or bad about it so it might be a film that I rewatch just to see how it holds up now that I have the animated version with the story arc, see how it ties in and see how they did it justice. But um, in the case of X-Men The Last Stand versus the cartoons, the cartoons handled it better because they gave it more breathing room to for the story to grow and develop. And then it gave us more interactions with other races and, and the X-Men. Um, as far as the overall stories and all of that, in general it was a story of the week except for the number of times that they had two parters or two to four part story arcs but in the general it was story of the week they tied in various other elements so whether it was Bolivar Trask or fighting with humans or fighting with Magneto and all of that it was ba each episode was basically a variation of that so after some time it does get a little bit repetitive but the benefit of the, of the cartoons and having a series is that they at some point allow most of the characters to grow except it felt like Cyclops. Um, I only really remember one episode maybe when they had a little bit of backstory for his youth but a lot of the cartoon spends time with um, Wolverine and Logan and his backstory and his growth. There's enough episodes with Jubilee which I know or my general thought is that there's a lot of people don't like her character in the cartoon but I mean granted it's I don't want to say annoying but for me it's she's a kid she doesn't feel like she's being hurt and she continues to act immature but she also is the youngest X-Men and she wants to try and get on the team so in general I don't think her character was bad and then they do give her an episode towards the end when she um, has to protect some kids in the caves under the under Xavier Mansion. So I think that was a good episode to show that she has a free spirit and um, she's still a kid and it kind of serves to remind the rest of the X-Men that um, she is a um, child and she wants to express herself and she's trying to do her best with the powers, her powers and um, all that's going on around them. 
Um, the main downside that I saw, or I felt like was in the show, was um, some of the voice acting and general um, styles of the show. So Wolverine and Logan's character was probably the best portrayed overall just because of his gruffness and um, kind of the way he is, but then trying to fit in, trying to or also being in love with Jean along with Cyclops and all of that. But then it feels like they um, carry over the same gruff exterior and acting style to Storm and Cyclops. So Storm felt like in just about every scene, she took it from zero to a hundred in almost no time at all. So it always felt like she was overacting and being um, overly dramatic for everything. Um, except for towards the end when they were on that other planet and the um, go, it's the episodes with the people who are um, slaving other uh, who have slaves and she actually falls in love so that was actually pretty normal and I actually liked that those episodes with her but the rest of the time when thing, anything happens she it just feels like it's overacting and then with Cyclops it feels like they applied that storm story act, or Storm's um, dramatic flair to Captain America's um, look and feel so that's kind of how Cyclops fell in all, in all of it and from there it didn't so they gave Storm a little bit more breathing room to grow and develop especially with the, um, the with her story arc in Africa and the Storm Goddess and all of that but Cyclops didn't feel like he got enough development he was the leader and that's all there was there was a chance with the loss of Green Jean Grey, but then they kind of tried to apply Logan and Wolverine style and habit of leaving when things didn't work his way. So I don't know, it just felt like they could have done more along those lines with all the various X-Men and give each character more time to develop than they did. Um, but overall, as far as rating the show, I'd probably give it about an 85%. The animation styles were good, except for the fifth season and the last few episodes where it feels like they changed up the drawing style or they were going to try and do something new but it felt totally random in seeing one particular um, artistic style and then switching to another one and if you're not sure you don't remember what i'm talking about it's kind of like a low budget version of what we saw in um x-men i think it was x-men revolutions that was that came out in the early 2000s i want to say so it was kind of all the different x-men and mutants in um high school and late high school kind of thing but it's kind of that drawing style but on a low budget so it's kind of weird when you see that it's like almost as if they didn't finish it um a more current comparison would be the lost season of star wars the clone wars where um, they didn't finish the animation style, so everyone felt stiff. There's missing artistic elements and design style, so it's not a complete picture of what they would have done to um, animate them. So that's kind of what we got in towards the end of season five. So it was kind of strange there. Um, and then the uneven um, story development of all the characters um, just feels like at the time they were going more for story of the week, and then. If it helps progress a character story arc and background and um, personality, then they would do that and fit it in. But that is about it. Um, as far as Professor X goes, it was okay. He did kind of feel like he went from zero to a hundred from time to time, but he was kind of a culmination of all the various um, characters, so it worked out okay. I didn't have, I didn't really think neither here nor there about him, but. Um, there's that. As far as all the other characters and all the villains go, they were about on par as what you would expect. Magneto was um, not necessarily over dramatic, but he um, is kind of going into um, okay, so if you read the comics and you know who the character is, then that's kind of Magneto. Mr. Sinister was okay. It was an interesting to see, or it's good to see him early on, but then not have his origin story until the very end. Um, and then Mystique was fine not having her, or I didn't, I mean, I think she was there early on and then it, she kind of petered out until later. Um, same thing with all the various other characters, they brought them in and out as needed kind of thing, so it was all a matter of convenience and story progression and that sort of stuff. 
And then things like, it was kind of weird, like towards the end when you don't see Cyclops for a few episodes. It was kind of weird, but then like reading online, some of those episodes in season 5, I guess, those events are supposed to take place in the middle of like season 4 or something like that. So there was a time when Cyclops was in there, or I guess it's a matter of they don't have the voice actor available or they don't want to animate him. So they're not going to really acknowledge not having him around or what he's up to. So weird things like that kind of stand out now when you're watching them all watching all the episodes back to back but because all the episodes are about 20 to 25 minutes long it's easy to get through um all like the first four seasons are full four seasons of like 20 to 25 episodes and then season five is like six or seven episodes so i'm kind of curious to see if they're going to or with the recent news that they're going to reboot and have new episodes in the 97 X-Men universe is going to see it's curious to see if they're going to continue that story arc with Professor X going out going with the Shi'ar to recover what happens with the X-Men in the school and all of that so um, it's nice there and then watching it now with the ending it's kind of curious to see that with the loss of Professor X at the end of I think Days of Future Past um, along with um, Jean and Jean Grey and Cyclops that you kind of see that mirror as far as um, the school having pro uh, progressed without Professor X as a leader and then Cyclops as the number one so or his side basically the number one sidekick but and all, all in all it was a good series it was fun to watch through and see all those episodes again and drawing styles and nice to see it without all the static here. so granted it's probably all done at like 480p resolution or 480 resolution but back in the day when watching it on tv it does get the whole standard definition blurriness and broadcast quality to it but um streaming it now directly from disney plus it was overall very or it was a lot better because it was a lot cleaner of a picture so whether it was 480 or 720p it was much cleaner and easier to watch now but then still you know the animation style still stands up as being kind of janky and weird as far as the style of the time so it'll be also curious to see if they continue with that or if they modernize it a little bit and which style they go with but um, all in all, I'm looking forward to it, um, and it kind of makes me made me appreciate what they did with the X Men live action films, because in the live action films, it looks like they were trying to merge a lot of different story arcs to summarize them into a film format, so you can see the inspirations for, you know, for the Dark Phoenix, even though it wasn't portrayed nearly as well um, in the Last Stand, and then thing, and then just generally introducing Professor X, the loss of Professor X. Um, introducing the characters, the um, tension between Cyclops and um, Wolverine, um, kind of having Rogue, and that's it kind of made me see in this case after watching the cartoon how Rogue was underused as a character in the films that she didn't really. They had, I think, they had a mention in the first film or maybe the second one about how Rogue took on some of um, Wolverine's less desirable personality traits, but it would have been nice to have more of her in the show, or in the movies. Um, in the cartoon, she was there plenty, and it, it was good as far, or her character there was well portrayed, so that's one of the other downsides to the live action films, along with the Dark Phoenix, that um, Rogue was not, it was not utilized as much or as well as they could have. And it's part, part of it is, I mean, they did show that, you know, this, the whole uh, effect of her draining Logan's life force, but it would have been nice to have um, more than that. And it would have been weird to pick whose um, ability she would have taken. So whether it was, so granted she took Logan's healing abilities, but if she had touched like Jean Grey and picked her tele telepathy or um touch storm and pay, had picked up some of her abilities like flying or something like that or um mild weather control like wind or something like that it would have been nice to have some of the minor things like that and it would have made the character that much better so like i said the cartoon i give it a grade of about an 85 percent it's kind of all over the place um and uneven but the drawing style was good enough the stories were entertaining enough um, the dramatic acting or over dramatic acting aside it was at least good to see the various characters and interactions and all of that and sets me up to be able to now 
enjoy whatever new content they put out in this version of the X-Men universe whenever it comes out. So that's all there is for this particular review. So if you have any questions, comments, feedback, stuff like that, then you can um, comment on this post on Twitter at PatelN01. The website is headphonesneal.reviews for our past episodes, subscription links, supporting the show, and all of that good stuff. And of course, as a uh, patron or a subscriber on the Patreon at patreon.com slash PatelN01, you will get the third beta episode as soon as it comes out. Um, and which it, um, will be the summary and when you listen to it you'll get um, that content which will include um, a review of this X-Men franchise along with everything else out for the week so be sure to subscribe there if you want to check it out and get early access to what is coming out for the podcast um, soon so that's all there is for this particular review thanks for tuning in and until next time